-hmm. Oh, magic makers. Again, this is one of these ones that I have had on my list because I am a recovering perfectionist. And I found Minnie J on Instagram and I literally like binged her entire page and I just fell in love with just the simple simplicity. You know, I'm all about the simplicity. And if you are someone who struggles from perfectionism or you feel like I don't even know what the hell that is, don't worry about it. We're going to dive into that today in this, uh, this week's podcast. So welcome to the show. Hi, Kim. Thank you so much for having me here as another recovering perfectionist. Nice to connect. Yeah. And, you know, I guess like, let's start there. Did you ever, you know, if you kind of like go back in time, did you ever think to yourself you were a perfectionist? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I think that's partially because um, these are expectations that people have of you, right? To be successful and to be a good student and um, be available to your family members and be a loyal and helpful human being. So again, I think part of the reason perfectionism often goes unnoticed is because it hides behind healthy, you know, relationship needs or healthy life goals. But again, what makes perfectionism different is that it's incredibly excessive. So mm -hmm. I absolutely suffered from consequences of my perfectionism which again what we often realize something is wrong is we have this sense of anxiety and for me it was a lot of guilt and mm. wondering oh who am I disappointing I must be so somebody must be upset with me something I must be doing wrong so it's like that like that like that 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 feeling that never goes away the sense of like uneasiness and guilt that was really eating at me that I knew something is wrong here yeah and you know it's, it's funny you're right because it's like every as a perfectionist the things you get um praised on it just feeds into that like that cycle like you're just like oh you know i had you know my my, my line was the straightest and i i got praised for it you know like i got a's i got praised for it so it's just like it just feeds into it like well this is what i must do who i must be in order to get that praise Absolutely. And I remember reading this one line, for example, from a book. Um, it, the book is called Secret Thoughts of Successful Woman by Valerie Young. Amazing book. But one of the particular lines that always stayed with me, she says in there, uh, for children, validation is like oxygen. Oh, you know, and when you when you realize, obviously, like that, that that metaphor of like validation is like oxygen, you really are tapping into what a innate need it is in us to mm -hmm. be validated, to be seen, to be celebrated, to be recognized and to be liked in a healthy way, to be liked by right. other people. Yeah. And, you know, as I, as I, you know, was prepping for this, this call, one of the things I was like, you know, I, I feel like I was groomed to be a perfectionist mm -hmm. and, and I don't, and if that's a triggering word, I apologize, but I feel like and you probably might feel this too, but I feel like um, as a person of color, as an immigrant, we had to do things differently. You know, we couldn't just, you know, and I think about like things that my my mom said to me, I can't just rest on my laurels. You know, I have to strive. I need to get the good grades, do, you know, B, 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 because life just not, isn't going to just be handed to me. And I just think the, of those as like, it wasn't meant to create perfectionism, but it was like, we're judged differently. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And it, you know, think you, you know, your, you know, your homework had to be better than anyone else because maybe deep down someone was expecting less of you. Yes. Yes. And there's this idea of needing to prove ourselves and prove our deserve, how much we deserve to be there. Mm. And as an immigrant myself, I came here two weeks before I turned 14. And I always say that gave my therapist and I a lot to work on to, to <laughs> come into a new country two weeks before you're turning right. 15, middle of your you're, adolescent year. You're right. You're and like, this, I'm already trying to figure out my own crap. Now I'm trying to figure out in another country. <laughs> yes. And it's like you go out of the house and your parents translator. And so you kind of have that like yeah. equal role with the parents teacher conferences, literally your parents teachers telling you something it's like these two authority figures 
and you're at the table with them. So you get the sense of like, I guess we're all the same level. Right. And then you come home, but oh, you got to be the kid now. So right. there's a lot of these, again, uh, dual roles you take on. And as you mentioned, like being an immigrant that I often share when people say, what are the cause of uh, perfectionism? When you notice some of the sacrifices your parents make, there is that underlying need to mm. make their sacrifices worthwhile. Yes, It's not yes. enough that I get into college. I have to go to a four-year college. Right. It's enough that... I study a major, it needs to be, you know, one that people will again celebrate or feel good about. Right. I think just major in art, not again, right. no disrespect to anybody who is an artist, but you know, that kind of societal opinions oh, yeah. or stereotypes. Oh yeah. And especially as an immigrant, like you can't have one of those fluffy kind of degrees. Like you have to have a degree that you could do something with. Like my daughter's a doctor or a lawyer, you know, something that, you know, society is very like, ooh. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, that is well-respected. Yeah, exactly. Um, and sometimes it's an internal dialogue we have. It's sometimes it's not, again, something I help people understand. It doesn't mean that your parents some parents may have verbalized some of these high achieving, uh, demanding expectations and outcomes. And other times they may have not. And it's an internal dialogue you have uh, that you have to, again, kind of pay back because you really appreciate the compromises your parents have made. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and I, and I think, you know, if we take out the um, race and the immigrant, I think many parents, unwittingly we put some of the expectations that we have on ourselves or the missed expectations we didn't do and my child is going to fulfill maybe the dreams that I was unable to fulfill or I you know everyone wants their kid to have a better life so it's like you know maybe I was the crappy student and so I want to make sure that my kid's the a plus plus student uh, yes, I think a lot of times we might model perfectionism without intending to. So that's where, as we know, breaking that generational cycle is very important for every one of us to do at least a little bit of work on ourselves to make sure we're not again modeling it. Because that also another layer of this conversation where it doesn't have to be told to us directly, but as soon as we see our parents or we as a parent don't make time for rest and we don't have a healthy balance in our lives we're as you know implicitly modeling implicitly uh, reinforcing these type of overachieving uh, lifestyle yeah exactly and so you know now you know you and I both said yeah I never really thought I was a perfectionist I just thought you know I was getting shit done you know it never really occurred to me that like you know I needed like it had to be perfect. It had to be like, you know, over the top. It couldn't, I, uh, I remember when I was a kid and I got a C and I'm like, mom, I got a C, I'm average. And I remember mom's like, you're not average. And, you know, just that, those like little words. I mean, 30 years later, I'm still freaking repeating it. And yeah. so it's like those little things, you know, kind of added up. And, you know, I don't think I recognized I was a perfectionist probably until about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was just what it did. Yes. Yes. And it really comes back to how do we define perfectionism? Mm. That is, again, the trap here. Because a lot of times we think perfectionism is simply me doing my best. Perfectionism yeah. is just me being a good friend who happens to be always available, though. Like, she never gets a sick day off. Like, she's always there right. for everybody. I can expect and, that text like that as soon as I text. <laughs> yes, yes. So I think we have to be honest with ourselves and, and really write down on paper, what is your definition of perfectionism? And then whatever whatever ends up on that piece of paper, be willing to objectively look at it and say, is that true? Really, is that same? Like perfectionism is same as me doing my best. And yeah. could that not be the case? Because there's no other way of moving forward without us initially being able to say, you know, perfectionism um, is a problem. Perfectionism is not same as me doing my best. And perfectionism is not the reason because one of the things I get from people is 
well, perf my perfectionism keeps me ambitious, motivated, driven. It gets things done. And we have to, again, be willing to say, but you're so burnt out and you're having panic right. attacks and you can barely sleep or you wake up middle of the night. I had so many moms wake up middle of the night and then do things like order food or order things from Amazon app, Target app. So I'm like, you have sleep disturbances, anxiety, panic attack. You feel burnt out. You feel like your relationships are not reciprocal because you give more than you receive. So those are the ways we can start to say, well, perfectionism, like my understanding of perfectionism is not healthy. Yeah. And so like, you know, you gave some good examples there, but like, let's go back. Cause like, I, I know that I, some of my clients, when I talk to them, you know, my, I primarily focus on weight loss and I'll say, Hey, Sally, you know, great week. Or they'll, they'll tell me oh, the week sucked. And I'm like, okay. Like, like, and so when you, when you tell me the week sucked in my mind, I'm like, Oh damn. Like you like ate every, every food in your cupboard and you're, you know, you're not. And so I'm like, how, why was it a crappy week? Well, I only got three out of five workouts in. And I'm like, three out of five is pretty good. Like, you know why? And so for them, they wanted five out of five and in their mind, that's not perfection. Mm. they're like I set a goal and I didn't hit it and so a lot of people listening to this don't really like they go there like well I told myself I was going to do five but I only got three done so it was a shitty week and I don't think I'm being a perfectionist I'm just I set a goal and I didn't hit it so clearly I suck where you and I now know we're like you're being a perfectionist sister like we're starting to nitpick all the little pieces here of our life because I didn't actually nail what I said I was going to nail this is a wonderful example for so many reasons I'm going to try to keep it concise here because often again another pushback I get from people is if I let go of my perfectionism I am going to have zero goals I am not going to achieve anything ding 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 <laughs> yes so I'm like okay Here's the other thing about perfectionism that this is such a great example of is perfectionism is also a, a belief system where people, as we know, like that have that false thinking where things are either black or white, yeah. all or nothing. So we want to help them understand perfectionism is not same as wanting to achieve goals. It's actually on your way of achieving goals, it's you thinking that if you're anything less than that goal or less than 100, less than five, all your effort has been disregarded, dismissed, minimized. That's what, again, the toxicity of perfectionism is. It's not about achieving or not achieving goals. It's about once you don't achieve that goal, the way that you dismiss all your efforts the way that you are blinded by not achieving that outcome and not seeing anything else that has gone well. And ultimately, which if I may maybe add to that scenario, what Sally does is then shame herself. Yes. And say, I am, I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. I am lazy. I am useless. I'm inadequate. I'm incompetent. I am not smart enough for this. I am not focused enough for this. I'm not disciplined enough for this. And then yep. what we're doing in those words is we are ultimately saying to ourselves, there is something missing in me that is worthy of this goal. Right. Yeah. So, and so yeah, exactly. And you're, you're absolutely right because it turns into this whole spiral where it's like, I wanted five. I'm not worthy. You know, clearly I'm not worthy enough or now I need to work harder. Now, instead of five, it's seven. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why did we change the goal? If I, I could get, I can't get to five. How am I going to, you know, double down? Yes. Yes. And this is where I also try to walk my clients through is it's not about, again, letting go of those goals. Right. It's just that, how are we approaching those goals? And I always mm. try to explain to them as you continue to work on certain goals for yourself. You cannot neglect rest. You cannot forget to celebrate the small wins. You cannot just say, well, it wasn't a five. So three is not the three times that I went 
to exercise is not worth celebrating because celebrating yourself is non-negotiable. Right. That that happens every day. And they're like, but I didn't do anything important. Right. That wasn't my comment. I said, yes. celebrating yourself is non-negotiable. I didn't say, you know, celebrating important things, celebrating small things and celebrating. So yeah. this is where I push people. It says nothing to do with the goal. It's about everything else that comes with achieving that goal that makes perfectionism so health unhealthy and toxic. Yeah, you know, I I love like I I I, I love what you just said because so many people think that in order for me to celebrate something, it has to be like I leaped the tall building in a single bound, right? Or I climbed Everest in one day. And you're like, what if you just flew to Nepal and you are just starting your journey? Like that's worthy of celebrating because how many people say they're going to climb Everest and never freaking do it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or it's like, you know, I I need to Google this for sure because I talk about Everest all the time. I have no desire to climb Everest. I've seen, I've seen all the movies. And it looks sucky. It's winter <laughs> camping. Two things I don't like, winter and camping. But every time I, I see it, because it's a great analogy, like they don't roll up on Everest. It's a process, you know? So every milestone you make up there, and not everyone summits. And so every milestone you make up there, you celebrate it because one, you're freaking alive. And two, maybe you, you still have your fingers. I don't know. But I think everyone here thinks that like I, I shouldn't celebrate that I did three because if I look back out of the three out of the five days maybe one day I was like it was a snowstorm and I freaking drove to the gym in a snowstorm maybe I like laid in bed at 5 30 in the morning and I was like oh damn I am not going but I talked myself into it so those are like two things I could celebrate and maybe that the second two was like I got a flat tire or my kid got sick so there was wasn't because I didn't say screw it I don't want to go like there was a life thing that happened Yes, yes. And what you are explaining is how we have to move past that five or no five black or white attitude mm. and be able to, like you said, celebrate the three. And then then what we're also let, then likely to do is have this conversation of understanding what happened with the two other times you didn't get to go. Of course, right. we want to problem solve. This is, again, where people have a, this hesitance is that as if we're going to not take accountability as if there's not going to be any type of movement in their lives if they were to let go of their perfectionism. What also I like to include in this conversation is helping ourselves celebrate who we are becoming as we achieve a goal. Ooh. And I think that is such a freedom to say, I am not what I accomplish. I am who I am practicing as I'm accomplishing those things. Like that yeah. self-motivation, self-compassion. Maybe like you give that example that was, like, oh, I was going to go to the gym and then um, my kid got sick. So I got a call saying I have to come pick up my kid, which I did. But then I asked my neighbor if they can watch my kid so I can do my appointment or my exercise routine. What you're also doing there is, the way you are reaching for help, the way you are delegating, the way you are having that community. So there are so many other things we become as we mm. achieve the goal that needs to be also looked at. But we have to then ask ourselves, how, why am I so outcome driven? How did yeah. I become this way? Again, was it the school the institutions that makes us so great oriented, the SAT scores, right? Yeah. And, you know, promotions and titles. Is it my parents? Is it the media where we are like, oh, how many likes you got? So we are yeah. all into these scores, right? How many yes. followers you got? So we can unpack all of those things and come to acknowledgement that there has been so many layers where I become so outcome driven, but overcoming perfectionism requires me to appreciate, like you said, the process, the effort, the person I'm becoming. Right. You, you said a couple of things that I absolutely want to like hit the nail in the, the head here. So you said, who am I becoming in the process? And so I, I, um, are you familiar with James Clear's book, uh, Atomic Habits? Atomic Habits. Yes. Yeah. So he always talks about, you know, habits drive everything, which I'm like, I am a disciple, but it's also one of the things he says why habits are important is because it describes the process. And so many of us skip past the process and we're so like, 
you know, lose the 20 pounds or, you know, get to California that we just put these blinders on and we don't like realize that the 50 steps it took us to get to said outcome. Yes. And I, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, one time I've heard him speak, he also talks about like the idea that you may achieve something at the hundred times you try it. And yeah. you have to not forget that it took you 99 trials and 99, you know, mistakes to get to that 100. So it goes back to really valuing the, the, the experience of trying things, value, valuing the process and the mm. growth that it takes when we achieve a goal. So that's all part of the conversation and shift. I think what right. we're also talking to people about is like this idea of like, we really need to redefine things. We really yes. have to change the way we're looking at things. It is nothing to do with having a meaningful, purposeful, you know, purpose-driven life. It's about how we're going to do things as we work towards whatever that we want to work on. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely, that, I absolutely love that. And so, you know, now for those of people who are like, okay, you know, Kim Mini J, you are starting to like see through my bullshit. And I'm starting to think that I never thought I was a perfectionist, but maybe I got some tendencies here. You know, what are some of the ways? And first of all, this isn't a, a flip, a, a light switch. Like after listening to this podcast, you're not going to be like, perfectionist, it's over. You know, how would I start to kind of um, break free of this? I think the first thing to do, as as you mentioned, hoping that these kinds of conversations help people gain a new insight on what perfectionism is and helping them kind of start to question. The next thing we do have to do is, is, is I'm sure you do as well with your work, identifying how it shows up in their lives mm. because it could show up so differently. So yeah. I really like people to, there's no shortcuts here. So it comes back to tracking things and you, you have to yeah. write things down. You know, you can't just like, oh, remember that um, because our thoughts are fleeting. You really yes. need to grab a piece of paper and write down. And there are a couple of giveaways because here's the other thing why perfectionism is a mental health issue because it changes the way you feel. Yeah. It may, it may feel good when we do things perfectly the first time, as you mentioned, as we talked about the validation and the appraisal we get, but ultimately perfectionism gets very debilitated because we can never keep up with it. There's nope. no finish line. No. So I would like people to think of the day, think of a time in the day that they felt overwhelmed, stressed, anxious, uneasy, and maybe even irritable. Because a lot of times I think our unhappiness shows through like irritability and document what was happening around that situation. And we will then start to understand well, I got angry because I was in the middle of something and then my husband called me to help him with something. Oh, so you were overextending yourself and you mm. were engaging in that people pleasing. Right, right, Instead right. of saying, I can't come right now, I'm in the middle of something. Right, yeah. You, you know, it's funny because it's like, you just said about people pleasing and I feel, you know, as women, we're socialized to stop, drop and run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, regardless of, whatever it is, you know, someone, the phone rings, stop, drop and pick it up, you know, and if someone needs a ride, you're stop, drop and do it. And I don't think many of us, and if we, and if we say no, we're the bad guys. Yes. Yes. And I don't think many, you know, I, I know that, you know, I have several clients who they're like, well, you know, I I have to cook dinner every single night. And I was like, well, do you? And like, well, if I don't cook dinner, who's going to do it? And, you know, I'm like, have you asked your family to chip in? And, you know, basically, you know, they looked at me like I asked, you know, do you have a third head? <laughs> it's, it's so not, foreign it's, or it's such a strange question, isn't it? Right. It's like, what did you just ask me? I'm like, I we're speaking English, right? But it's like those like, thoughts just keep just get caught like I'm the only person who could do it right or they're not going to do it the way I do it so we just kind of like push them aside without even saying hey you know could you help me out here on nights I work late absolutely and I think 
what you just said about they're not going to do it right is a big part of why sometimes perfectionists tend to be very come across very controlling and mm. also very judgmental because they yeah. always have an opinion about how things might be done. Um, they may come across like they're complaining a lot. They have, again have an opinion on how things need to be, and that's not necessarily because they're bad people or mean. It's because for them, again, they have their internal expectation that if something is not perfect, it won't be good. If something is not perfect, it won't be, you know, good for all of us, not just good for me, good for all of us. Right. So that's, again, their internal false thinking showing up in the relationship, family relationship as like, God, mom is always finding something wrong with my homework. Mom always right, finds exactly. something wrong with the traffic. Um, and I, I had clients tell me like they go to restaurants and their mom is always complaining about something with the restaurant. Uh <laughs> <laughs> And I thought that was so like, yes, yes, exactly. And I thought that was such an honest and common example of restaurants and how we all can always find something to complain about. Yeah, no, and you're, and you're right. And I feel like as a, you know, as, and I'm hoping that people who are listening to this, they're like, oh yeah, that's me. That's me. And, um, and I've just done a training and we were just talking about like this, these types of conversations aren't to make you feel bad. They're awareness. It's just more like, you know, it's, I think about it like watching the news, except for it's never like, you know, man killed his wife and so forth. This is more like, hey, did you know that maybe you're that person who like sees everything wrong? Great. Awesome. You're observer. But are you observing it because you think it should be better? And, you know, even if you go to a five-star restaurant, you're going to find something. Absolutely. And it's a reminder that like, even, you know, one shoe will not fit all. So every yeah. one of us will, of course, have different experiences in a restaurant we go to. As you said, hopefully people find reassurance that this is part of self-awareness. And maybe I can bring up another key component of overcoming our perfectionism is self-compassion. Yeah. We have to give ourselves a sense of empathy and understanding that mm -hmm. we have been trying to do things perfectly, may have come across a bit controlling, may have come across a bit difficult to negotiate with because, you know, mom is so, you know, stuck on her ways. But ultimately it was from a place of wanting things to be perfect. So it was good for everybody. Right. And, or we wanted things to be perfect. So nobody got hurt at the end. So again, compassion, empathy, understanding, ultimately forgiveness, because here's the other thing that happens with people, as I'm, I, I'm sure you experienced this, where they think that self-accountability means punishment. The only way I can have accountability is I am, you know, punish myself with words or with, you know, taking something away from myself. And they forget that you can do self-accountability with compassion. Your yes. self-accountability is not any less because you're actually nice to yourself while you're apologizing. Exactly, exactly. And I, 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 self-compassion, you know, is so underutilized, you know, because we're very, we're very hard on ourselves. Um, I just was watching um, a video and this woman, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write myself a note to attach it to the show notes. But there was this woman and she was, she was like saying out loud what she said in her head. And so she's like, um, I put on a swimsuit and this woman just stared at me in the locker room. And she said, how dare you put, like, who do you think you are? I don't need to see that here at the gym. Like, what do you think you're doing here? And then she like, you know, went on and on, like all these like different places that she went to and all the conversations. And at the end, she revealed it was her inner thoughts. And it was like the most, like the thoughts you're like, oh my God, someone said that to you. Like, how, holy shit. I can't believe you like put up with that. You didn't say anything back. And I'm like, how many times, you know, I told myself I was going to work out five times and I only got three. And I'm like, I suck. Like, who am I? Like, I might've just lay down and wait for my 600 pound life to call me. Like just all the things we tell ourselves because we couldn't just sit down and be like, you know what? Three is better than none. And if our and kids- and if our kid, like, you know, got three out of five, like, way to go, Johnny. <laughs> yes, yes. What I love about this, and I can't wait to watch the video, is the part you said, 
oh gosh, if I heard someone said that to you, I'd be like, wow, how'd you put up with that? That's so wrong. wrong. Maybe you should have called the manager, right? So it made me just realize how if someone tell me their partner talks to them that way, I would yes. start talking to them about abusive relationship, right? Mm -hmm. I would start to like psychoeducate them on, do you know what emotional abuse is? Do you know what, you know, cycle of abuse looks like? Because that's a definition of abusive relationship when that kind of verbal exchange happens in a relationship. But when it comes to our internal dialogue and it includes those mean words, we forget or haven't been taught that that's also a form of abuse. It's a called self-abuse. That yeah. you are talking to yourself in an abusive manner that is degrading, that is devaluing um, your, your overall being worthiness and it needs to stop yeah and you know when I saw that I was like you know what I, I'm like I need to uh and I'm glad I, I, I it popped in my head because I was like I need to share this because I don't know how many times I've said it to myself like my inner my inner critic is like a former gang member like she just like it's just so hardcore and I know many of my clients because we're a type a plus plus with a side of a plus like, like everyone's looking for the a plus like what can I do for extra credit and for many people I'm like do the damn basics that's extra credit and you know as a striver you know if you think back to grade school like what can I do for extra credit that really resonated with me so deeply so deeply and I remember like I'm sure again we have hundreds of these examples I remember I passed my uh, my exam and if you pass it's just they say you pass and if you didn't they give you a part like a specific score so I guess maybe you can know how far away you were from the passing right. limit and I I'll tell you on a story I remember passing my exam and telling my very good friend the urges I had to learn what my score what your was. number was right yes because I needed to know was I 90 let's say 80 percent right. was a passing I was like was I 90 or was it 81 because 81 is a mediocre passing right but exactly. if I pass with a 90 or 95 then I was a good pass you know I, I really was smart and my right. friend luckily having good people around you she's like do not do not ask them what your final score was you got the pass which is again was the rule right you, you get a pass you you're told you pass that's all you need to know and I didn't, but looking back, look at the urge I had that I needed to know, was it an 81% passing? Because that makes me like, mm, you're actually right. a failure deep inside. You just got lucky with one question, maybe. And that would be my inner critic saying, you didn't earn that pass because you see it's 81. And absolutely, it's just that inner critic ready to latch on to anything. Right, to, to just try to knock you, knock yourself down. Because I there was a, um, I think it was a movie and the person said, you know what separates um, Harvard from any other medical school? And mm. they're like, no, but that's what? You know, like expecting this like magical answer. They're like, nothing. They still call you a doctor. <laughs> and, you know, and if you think about it, like, you know, as, you know, hindsight being 2020, everyone's like, oh, you need to go to the most prestigious college and blah, 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 blah. A degree is a degree. It's just a matter of what you do with it. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's definitely... Sometimes, yes, I think sometimes we can get a degree and it comes back to really valuing the person that we're becoming as we get a degree or we complete a marathon. Because look, I'm not these, I'm not obviously devaluing any of those achievements, but I also right. want to, again, encourage people not to overvalue the achievement and really value because anybody can do a marathon and I'm not much of an athlete, but as you, you know, if I put my mind into it, I could do the marathon but did I really learn the more core values as someone sh should as they achieve a goal like did you you know value work-life balance or value education as you get this degree or did you just pass because it's easy to do those things right yeah no I um and I and I and I see like so many of us can kind of get caught up in our cycles of like good enough and so that maybe that perfectionism keeps us from twofold starting something like oh in order to start here is the laundry list of things that have to like line up in order for me to get started yeah or 
I did something and I didn't get the result I wanted. So I'm off here seeking, you know, the perfect thing that's going to like really get me over the top. And I see, you know, those two things, especially when it comes to health and exercise, it's like, I got to find the perfect diet because I tried that diet and it didn't work. And we don't think about, well, how did I do the steps? It was the diet. Yes. It's never me. And what's helpful also with that kind of examples are understanding perfectionism can show up so differently. Meaning we were talking about often people may complain a lot and control things a lot. I've also seen perfectionists be the biggest procrastinators. And oh God, yeah. Indecisive, delaying decisions. And exactly what you said, the underlying belief is if it's not going to be perfect, it's not worth starting today. Yeah. If it's not going to be perfect, then um, I'd rather have somebody else go first. So yeah. perfectionism leads to a lot of that analysis paralysis where you never get started. Or if you even happen to start something, you can finish it because midway, like you, we talked about, you haven't progressed the way, you know, you didn't meet that marker like you wanted it to come day three or day week five you stop right. midway and again it's this rigid ideas of how it's supposed to look like and i know that for perfectionists there's a lot of missed opportunities yes. because of that fear of taking a chance fear of trying something but also perfectionists tend to miss the opportunities because they only like to do the things they can do really well yes oh my god do that right there ding like conversation over <laughs> I see it all the time with my clients is that you know they've been dieting the same way for 15 years and mm. I'm like you know what guess what your body's like I know exactly what you're gonna do to me so I'm just gonna sit here smoke a cigarette and just watch you we gotta do something different and the fear of you know making that right hand turn versus making that left hand turn it's freaking paralyzing mm. and this is, I, I think, one of the places that people don't think that they're being perfectionists because it's like you only do what you the known outcome is. Yes, yes. I know if I eat just like this, I exercise just like this, I'm going to get this result. But if I want something different, then I'm going to have to make that left-hand turn. And, and the problem here is also not just fear of failure or fear of the unknown. I would also like to, again, bring it back to fear of doing things imperfectly. Yes. Yes. And sometimes doing things perfectly, I have found out one of the interesting things I've found out is the expectations people have about the pace that they do things and that perfectionists often expect themselves to do things quite fast mm. and they want things to be fast and smooth so if anything is taking them longer than it should or if it's not a smooth experience yeah then they say that's 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 not perfect therefore it's imperfect slash failure so i do feel like with diet or new exercise routine or a new way of you know connecting with your body if it's not going to be again smooth ride or if it's not going to be fast like oh you want me to go do this exercise but because i'm so unfamiliar with it instead of 10 minutes it took me 15 minutes that feels like an imperfection to them because it wasn't again within this timeline it took longer there's again i i i, I hope this is making sense to people but there's yes. really a perception people have where they say things that i do fast are better than things yes. that i do slow yeah you and, and you hit the nail on the head there with about the um time you know it's like if so it, it's it's twofold with the time especially in the exercise world so some of my people are like ah kim i just can't really do a 90 minute workout anymore great me either and so i'm like here's how you collapse the time and you get in and out faster mm -hmm. or other people are like if i don't do a 90 minute workout is it a good enough workout and so that time just does like a, a, a complete like, you know, like messes with your head because you're just like, I've been told I need to do this, but if I shift this thinking, am I going to get the same results? So it's like yes. part of you, even though you don't want to do that 90 minute workout, 
that fear, that anxiety that I'm not going to get my outcome just like paralyzes you. Because I think that there are these link we have made where yeah. specific time is the best one. Yes. So anything other than that, whether it's 90 minutes, 60 minutes is what's the opposite of best, worst. Yeah, like It's this very black or white thinking for people that we have to be able to live in the gray. Mm. And obviously what you also gave with that example, or at least stood out to me is being able to find. So one of the things I love talking about, and sometimes I got people to like, ask me to explain it because it seems such a, maybe a buzzword is authenticity. Mm. You have to do what works for you. That's my definition right. of authenticity. Yeah. Not getting stuck on, like you said, what have you been told about duration of exercise? That's again, quote unquote, best ask yourself with where I am in life. Maybe if you're struggling with depression or you have, you know, just gave birth because I have a friend who's giving birth this morning, you know, where you are in life, what will be the most authentic time for you? Let's I'm, I'm guessing like, that's how you would go about this because you really want to let go of this best ver worst. Right effective, ineffective, perfect, imperfect, let go of those labels and really try to connect with what will be most authentic for me. And ideally also what will be practical, right? We, like I was right. saying earlier, none of this conversation is about delaying achieving goals. None of this conversation is about neglecting goals. I am all like, I'm a very behavioral person in terms of like life and therapy. Like I absolutely want people to achieve goals. I absolutely want people to make changes in their lives. This goes back to the conversation of, I would like this to be more loving, compassionate, peaceful yeah. experience for you. Yeah. Not that I hate myself. I'm not going to achieve anything in life. That's self-hatred, self-abuse. That's what perfectionism is. Yeah, no. And, and I like that It because it, I, I like what feels authentic. Because I think guilty is charged. We all get caught up in the Guru A says this, Guru B says that, I read on this, social media says that, and you get so jumbled where at some point you just have to say, okay, girl, like what feels good for me right now? And someday, maybe a 90 minute workout feels good for you. But if that means that three out of five and you can't do the 90 minutes for five days, maybe you're like 60 minutes, 30 minutes is good enough. Absolutely. And I think that I love that again, breaking it down and understanding what went wrong in my goal for that past week you can then again have that conversation with yourself well I guess that's a 90 minute the first three days led me to burn out for the other two I wanted to do how can I make changes for myself but I want people to understand because here's something I, I maybe I'm thinking to myself but I can imagine someone saying listening to this well I can do that I can have that conversation I can study my you know behavior but again, are you studying your behavior from a place of self-loathing? Yes. Or are you studying your behavior and trying to problem solve and correct and improve from a place of knowing I'm enough? I've done yeah. my best. Last week, I've done my best and my best is enough, which was three times of exercising. Right. And it's funny because it's like, yeah, can, can I be it that like, you know, I always use CSI. I'm like, can I be like the CSI of my week and just say, okay, dead body, how did it happen? Or am I coming in like, well, that girl, she set herself up to die. That's why she's dead on the floor. Love that. Yes, exactly. That kind of curiosity we can have towards our goals versus like you were saying earlier with perfectionism, it's like, well, I failed. Well, what I got to do is next week, I got to catch up and I got to go seven times now. Yeah. I love the, the catch up. It, I, there's always, it, and it goes back to that extra credit. Like, you know, like you got an 80, but I wanted a hundred. So teacher, what can I do to make up the 20 points so I can get extra credit? And once you know that achieving or falling short of your goals is no indication of how capable you are of achieving them and how deserving you are of achieving them and how you have what it takes to achieve them you don't uh, then fall for that trap all right so I'm going to rewind what you just said you said you have what it takes and right there for many people it becomes into that tapping into more of that self-trust mm. and less into the self-doubt because 
the self doubt camp is filled. Like everybody, it's like a con it's like the Taylor Swift concert. Everybody wants into that 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 self doubt. Like that is like the e that that's a ticket that everyone wants to get into. But it's that self trust. It's that like up and coming artist that like you never heard of, but they're gonna be the next Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. that no one really wants to go over there because it rely it, you have, I have to rely on myself. I have yeah. to like tap into a place that I've never tapped into before. I, I'm afraid also people tend to lean toward that self-doubt because they think it's protective. Yeah. And we really need to understand self-doubt is limiting. It's not very protective. And of course, there's a difference between constructive feedback versus self-doubt. Right. You know, of course, evaluate your choices and your behaviors and give yourself constructive feedback. But that's not what self-doubt is doing. Self-doubt is saying, give up. Self-doubt yeah. is saying, what were you thinking? That in, like self-doubt has that tone of judgment and meanness to it. Yes. So again, I want people to understand self-doubt is not same as giving ourselves constructive feedback. Right. And, you know, and if, and for everything you do, there is that confidence level. So like, yeah, maybe you are feeling a little butterflies trying something new. And yeah, a little self-doubt is, 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 is good. You know, think, think, think of it as like a shot of tequila. It's a shot of tequila versus drinking the whole bottle. No yeah. joy comes from drinking the whole bottle. Trust me, I've done it. So, but if I take a shot, that is like, it's just that your nervous system is always going to try to protect you. Your mind is always going to try to protect you, but it's like overcoming that self-doubt and moving into that. You know what? I'm okay if I take this shot of tequila, but I'm not okay if I do the whole bottle. And I would say one th one more thing to add, maybe we didn't mention yet was the comparison. Oh, because I think- Oh my God. We could do a whole episode on that. Right, <laughs> right. It's like, because it just dawned on me how much of that self-doubt also comes from when we compare ourselves to other people. Yes. Like, oh, this person exercised five times or this person achieved their goals in three weeks and I'm on week five. I yeah. am far behind. And just last night, maybe this is why I thought of it. I was seeing this and I know this has been around for a while, but this really nice post on social media that listed famous people and the age that they have achieved what they have achieved. And it was oh, like later in life. It's one yeah. of those 40, 50, 55, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like where are we? And, and, and few other people, I, I can't remember right now, all of them. And I think it is important to be reminded of these mm -hmm. informations. Because we really think, oh, I had to be 20. You know, I had to be, you know, 30 when I was working on my body. I'm too old to work on my body. It's again, too, right. it won't happen to me. I'm too old for this. And or like I was saying earlier, well, the other person did it again. They were on track three weeks. They achieved their goal. I'm on week five. It's just not going to happen to me. And that's what feels a self-doubt too, is that we compare ourselves to other people in a way to make ourselves feel inadequate and not worthy or capable. Yeah. Or, you know, or it also like, you know, I talked about that fork. It keeps me stuck because it's like, I look at you and I'm like, she did that. You know, she ran a marathon in four hours. I can only run a mile in two hours. Yeah. You're like, she's been running her whole damn life. <laughs> so of course she's of course she's a, a, a much much better runner than me because I just freaking started or you know business wise like she's a millionaire and you're like but you just started your business yesterday like how do you expect yeah. to be a millionaire overnight so I, I comparison is huge because so many of us will look at people and they'll say you know well she's got two kids how come I don't look like that? Or how come her house is so perfect with two kids? Like my house is always a hot mess because my kids you know, rip everything up. And it's just kind of like, it's, I know, and it's hard to keep your eyes on your own paper. And mm -hmm. I have a love hate relationship with social media because like you see people and, you know, other podcasters have this beautiful, you know, studio. I'm here in my office. <laughs> like it, I'm talking into a a uh, box with some egg crates it is what it is and the beauty is that that doesn't stop you from doing what you want to do and what you love to do and I really think that's also what's again authenticity and overcoming perfectionism is allowing the experience to be what it is trying not to compare it and try not to have these specific 
a vision of what it has to look like because then you're li- we're, we limit ourselves to yes. our comfort zone. We limit ourselves to what we're familiar with and never explore. I, 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 this, that is like the perfect part here to like end our, our talk on the limitations. You know, no one wants to look back, you know, when they're 80 and think about all the things they could have, would have, should have done. And, you know, some of the stuff that you're trying, it isn't, you know, scary. Jumping out of plane is scary. But, you know, trying to, you know, take a test to become whatever it is that you want to become. Like, mm-hmm. not that scary. Running into, like, gunfire, scary. But, you know, running a marathon, not so scary. It's really, yes, it's really separating what's a real threat and what's a made up threat. Right. You know, what's a threat that my doubts have created? What's a threat that my fears have created? Because again, I'm so afraid of failing and I'm so afraid of being imperfect that I will not try this. I will believe that is a limitation of mine. And like you mentioned, like if we listen to those limitations, we're going to be so stuck at a place. And right. and over time, here's where things will catch up with you. This is just not something that will ever last. It may feel like a solution today, but eventually your life doesn't feel good. Your life does not feel magical. Your life does not feel fulfilling. And that's why this conversation just can't wait. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I love that you, you you gave that very simple thing. You're like, you have to track, you know, and I, and most people, when I say track your food, like, you know, I get the eye roll, but it's like, if you don't know, you don't know. And we don't, that's the, 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 the honest thing is that a lot of things we do so automatically, yes. a lot of things we do because we're rushing. Mm-hmm. And like you said earlier, like tracking is not like, um, it's a, it's not a boot camp. It's an right. act of self-awareness. You know, this is conversation is not to make people feel like they're horrible human beings because they were being, you know, complaining or comparing themselves or their kids to other people. It's self-awareness. So hopefully with with compassion, it's not as intimidating to track certain things. Um, So we really know what we're looking at. Right. And so I ask everyone one question is that what's one thing that makes you feel magical? This is something I am trying every day, which is my being my imperfect self. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yes, absolutely. Showing up in your perfect self. And um, where can people find you on the socials? The best place to find me, honestly, is Instagram. That's where I'm genuinely in, like most active. So they can find me on Instagram and there are other resources in there, but Instagram is the best place to find me. And then you also have, um, you have a, a, uh, a perfectionist is it a quiz that you have I have a mini email course that mini. I love to share with people and I just put that together a few months ago so what happens is you subscribe to it and you get an email from me walking you through six steps to overcoming perfectionism so it's all an email so you can read it with some prompts uh, in that email on your own time and no strings attached if you ever feel like that wasn't the right fit for me you can unsubscribe so that's actually a resource that I'm really proud of. And I know that people will get a lot of value out of it. Yeah. I mean, I just got a lot of value out of this. Like I just, I, I'm like, I wish I, you know, stumbled across you 10 years ago when I first realized like all of my freaking perfectionism crap. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on everyone. Please make sure you follow her on Instagram. She does some great um, infographics that are really simple and to the point. Um, that can really just help you on your awareness journey. And if you are someone who's like, huh, maybe that's me, take her up on her offer, do the free course. Like she said, no obligation. You know, it's just more about awareness and how do, can we stop living a life of limitation? Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. <laughs>